hello curious about other pathways in tv film like creative executive roles etc and how to get them Ooh, chow. those are the most coveted roles in hollywood um and, and people usually get there in one of two ways maybe there are other ways to get there i'm gonna tell you how people usually get there one of two ways becoming an assistant at an exec at, at a studio or at a network where actual executives work so not just being an assistant to a director on someone's set somewhere right but being an assistant on the desk in the studios in the networks possibly at an agency right and then sitting on that desk forever until you get an opportunity to get promoted up and the reason i say forever i was saying this to somebody the other day probably on a podcast interview that's going to come out next week but the thing about it is so many people want to be executives but there are not enough executive roles for everybody who wants to be one to be one so the numbers don't match right so let's just talk about one particular network right let's say at this one network there are five executives each one of those executives has an assistant those five executives though are hierarchically placed which means you're not going to jump from assistant to EVP, right? So that means you're waiting for a manager position to open, if that's the title they use. Some people just uh, uh, generally or generically call them creative executives, but in most people they have most places they have titles, and manager is the lowest of those titles. So you're waiting on the manager. So let's say there are five executives that work there. There's only one manager. You're waiting on this one manager to get promoted to leave and go do something else (laughs) and let's say that person does that's one manager that just left and five assistants hoping they can get that position and guess what happens when they get ready to hire they might not hire either one of those assistants they might hire an executive from somewhere else to come in and take that position they might hire an assistant from somewhere else to come and take that position and so because of that you end up sitting at that desk for quite some time trying to get your opportunity to become an executive. So you have to keep your ears to the ground because there could be an executive position opening somewhere outside of your department, outside of your network, outside of your studio. And if you're interested in getting that job, then you have to have the connections to be able to let them know that you're even interested. A lot of people who want to be executives have agents. It's not something that, you know, people talk about a lot, like you don't have to have an agent, but agents always know when someone's coming and when someone's going. And so if they're cool with you and you're an assistant somewhere and they know that someone's leaving their executive position, their manager position over at some place, they could be the one that calls you and says, hey, these people are leaving. You want me to slide your resume over there? That's the thing I hate about this industry. It's all who you know for everybody. It's not just like that for writers. You know what I mean? So like when writers are sitting at home pouting about like nobody will let me in. It's like that on every level. It's my, like one of my goals. And I'm not going to put my whole thing out here because then somebody somebody who has closer contacts to sponsors is going to go do it. They're going to take my idea. So I'm not going to put it all out there. But I really want more people especially people of color to know about creative executives because if they did a lot of them would not be trying to be writers or directors or actors they're only trying to be that because that's all they've been exposed to but if they knew creative executives existed and that they would have creative control and creative power and a salary more would be going that way it's just as tough to get there as it is anything else why not at least when you get there you know you good you know what i'm saying you pay your bills for a little while Let's see, what's the best resource to use to find out who the new assistants are? Good question. I can't necessarily say that there is anything out there that tells you who someone's assistant is. The best thing you can do is if you have IMDb Pro, you can get the phone number to the place and call and ask. That's about the best you can do. I don't think in IMDb Pro, I could be lying to you, but I don't think in IMDb Pro, it lists who the assistants are because assistants can come and go. You know what I'm saying? Also, it's kind of might be a privacy thing. So I've never seen that, but the phone numbers are there. So if you go into IMDb Pro, I'm saying pro on the end of it. That's the paid one. You got to pay for this. If you go into that one, you have access to everybody's phone numbers and email addresses, maybe not their email addresses for everybody, but phone numbers, addresses, things like that. So you can call and just ask who's on the desk of insert person. And maybe they'll tell you, maybe they won't. But other than that, I don't think there's a list. 
where you can find those people. But if you are ever in email contact with any of the top people, nine times out of 10, you're in contact with their assistant, not them. Let's see, should you work as a set PA in hopes of getting into a writer's room or get a survival job and use the extra time to write and enter competitions net, uh, slash network? Um, set PA doesn't necessarily equal getting you to the writer's room, but it is a, it is a pathway. It's definitely a pathway. Um, in my opinion, survival jobs are for people who have other mouths to feed. Let me say that again. If you move out to Los Angeles and then go get a real job, I guarantee you that real job is going to keep you from the thing that brought you to LA, which now means you're going to be spending all of your time trying to go to work to pay your bills because it costs a lot to live out here. And you're never going to be able to go right. You're never going to be able to get to the networking event. You're never going to be able to volunteer on set because you have a regular, regular job. Right. Um, so sometimes that's necessary because you have other people to be concerned about. You have dependents or you have a husband, a wife or whoever, a dog, whatever. So you need to make sure that you have a steady income. OK, if quite if possible, I suggest get a job within the industry. It does not matter where it is. Get one on the inside, because if you are on the outside, then you're not doing yourself any favors. You, you know, now there are a million ways to get in. There's no one way. So you could be on the outside and be attending network events every weekend. And that might work for you. You should, if you want to be a writer, you should go be a PA period. Cause you need to learn what it looks like to make your words come to life. And it'll make you be a little different in your writing. <laughs> you will realize, man, I was asking them to do all of that. Yes, you were. And that's why your budget was out of control. Right. Um, so, yes, I think you can be a PA and you can actually, you know, make your way to the to the writer's room if you're doing the networking and talking to the people and actually have samples ready when they say, oh, hey, what do you have? Right. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to mean that you have to be a set PA. Like there are no um, there are no uh, there is no one way. It's not like if you do this, you'll make it. But that has worked for lots of people. And I think it's a great way to go because if nothing else, you're still learning while you're there. And look, y'all, being on a crew will get you booked far more than trying to be a writer. And I'm not saying don't try to be a writer. I'm just saying if you go on set and you start working and you realize you like something else that's going on on set, this is a collaborative process. That film, that film or that TV show cannot get made without those other people who are there on the crew. So if you end up, you know, crewing and you're like, you know what? I actually like being a first AC. Child, be a first AC. Because they're going to stay booked while you out here trying to be a writer. And I'm not saying that to discourage you from being a writer. I'm just saying, just like I was talking about being a creative executive, there are just so many other ways that you can participate in this thing. And it doesn't have to be writing. Like, if you really love it, then yeah, go after your passion. But if you just are doing it because you think that's the only way that you can have some uh, creative input, it's not. There are so many other ways. How do um, people with entry-level industry jobs survive do they pay livable wages no they don't <laughs> when people say you're a starving artist they're not they're not joking with you no they don't um i haven't been an assistant in a long time so i can't tell you specifically what they're making. sorry i almost lost y'all i can't tell you what they're specifically making now but when i was an assistant i was only making 500 dollars a week i lived in a tiny, tiny place, literally walk in, sit on the bed. I'm not exaggerating. Walk in, sit on the bed. Um, I did not have cable. I had a TV with no antenna. So this was back in the day, right? So right now people are like, you don't need an antenna anyway. You needed one back then. I had a TV and a DVD player and I watched the same DVDs over and over every day or I ordered from Blockbuster online. Yes, I'm aging myself. Um, I like back then I used to put sausage in my spaghetti. I couldn't buy no sausage. So it was just spaghetti. You know what I'm saying? I did not go out. I did not, you know, eat out very often. I didn't do any of that because I couldn't afford to. So, I mean, it's, it's not, and I'm not saying that any of it's okay. We're just talking about what it is, right? And if that's what it is, then that's why it's like, you got to love this thing. You can't come out here doing it because you just, oh, well, you know, I just have a story to tell and it just would be so fun to like, no, this is a grind. This is not for the faint of heart. You're going to get more no's than yeses. Okay. And you're going to get a dollar for whatever it is that you're doing. 
You know what I'm saying? So, no, nah, they don't pay livable wages <laughs> in assistant uh, in assistant positions. And the amount of work that you're doing, which is usually um, overtime, etc. No, no. But you come out here and you take that risk because it's really what you love to do. You're not playing around about it. You know what I mean? Uh, what advice do you have for a writer director? Important things to know. Um, that's kind of a big question. So uh, can you break that down a little bit? Um, what advice do I have for a writer director? Write and direct. That's like, <laughs> that's the biggest thing. You need a, a reel of directing your own stuff. So write and direct as much as you can. Um, are crew members 1099 employees or maybe they re- they sometimes work under a company and receive W-2s? Yes, <laughs> to both. Um, so I know, um, uh, there has been some stuff going on with taxes that it's saying that crew members can't be 1099s. So when someone makes a production, they, uh, incorporate as a production, that production becomes production LLC. And then anyone who's working for that production is an employee, even if that production only lasts a week or lasts a month or whatever. Some people try to get around that, especially if they're independent films. And they just do whatever they want to. And we just hope the IRS doesn't come after them. Um, but generally speaking, uh, like if you're in Hollywood, you're working for the incorporated production of the film. So you are an employee. Um, and you will get X amount of W-2s at the end of the year, depending upon how many you have. How many samples do you recommend and should you concentrate in one genre or diversify? I'm going to put it like this. If somebody walked into a room and said, oh my gosh, I can do this, 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 are you going to think they can actually do all of that? Versus if someone comes in and says, you know what? I'm really great at this. You have to brand yourself as a writer. It doesn't matter if you're great at all of those things. People are not going to believe you. I'm not saying that means you can't be great at it. I'm just telling you what the people are going to think. And the people are going to think, no way you're great at all that. You have to brand yourself, right? Nike sells t-shirts, socks, headbands, but their commercials are about shoes. (laughs) You know what I mean? They're telling you, we do shoes. We do shoes really well. And eventually it became, we do athletes. We do everything that athletes need. It's a brand. You are a brand as a writer. Brand yourself. Doing all of the things is not going to get you anywhere. Doing one thing great will. What that means is figure out the thing that you like. And there may be ways to work through subgenres. So for example, if you write dramas, it doesn't mean that you can't do a drama D. It does not mean that you can't do a sci-fi drama. It does not mean that you can't do a thriller drama. But you write dramas, right? Um, uh, What I will say is these days people are writing TV and features, but the games are just totally different from each other. And in my opinion, unhelpful. Like if you want to be a TV writer and they say, send me your samples and you send them three features, what are you, what are you, what are you telling them? (laughs) Are you really telling them that you know how to write for TV? Because you just sent them three features. Um, but you know, becoming a TV writer is a totally different game. It has a totally different process in everything. So if you want to write for TV, be writing for TV. Like you're not teaching yourself anything by writing on features. It doesn't mean that you can't write features because that's what you like to do. And you just want to do it in your own time. Great. Do it. But as far as being able to show somebody a feature sample, when you're trying to get a TV job, what do you think about having mentors as a writer? If you need a mentor, get one. I don't think anything about it. I think people need what they need for themselves. Some people don't need mentors. Some people do need mentors. It's really just about what you're looking for from that mentor. Are you just looking for free notes? Or are you looking for somebody who can guide your career? Well, have they had a career in doing it? Um, Or are they just a teacher? And I don't mean just a teacher as in negative um, just a teacher, but just a teacher as in they haven't had a career, so they can't mentor you in doing that. Um, Are you just looking for somebody to, you know, kind of like I said before, a lot of the times, and this doesn't mean this is what you mean, a lot of the times people want to mentor because they just want to be able to get gain all of their resources without giving anything back. (laughs) You know what I mean? They just want somebody to give them the game. Just give it to them. You know, without them having to pay for it, you know, like when people say, hey, you know, can I take you for coffee so that I can get all of the information that you spent all your time figuring out? But I just want you to give it to me right here in these five minutes. 
Um, so there are mentorship programs out there and those are usually structured to, to, so that you know what you're getting or not getting. But at the end of the day, I think mentorship is important if you think mentorship is important. You just have to find the right mentor. You have to know what you're looking for from that mentor. I've had people send me an email, will you be my mentor? What does that mean? What does that mean? I usually don't even respond. I said it because it's too generic of a question and I'm not about to go back and forth with you. (laughs) But also the answer is no, um, because this is what I do for a living. So what you just asked me was do what I do for a living for free. Do I come to your job and ask you to do what you do for free? I don't. So don't be sending me no email asking me to do what I do for free. The answer is no. Okay, let's see. Uh, Does the pilot have to be written before you pitch? No. That was easy. Um, (laughs) What I will say is, though, if you're a brand new writer, nine times out of ten, you're not going to get into anybody's room pitching anything unless you have a script. Um, But people who are already in the industry pitch without a script all the time because they're just talking to people they already know. And they're like, hey, can I, well, can, we should come in. So I got some stuff I want to talk to you about. Great, come on in. They come in, they pitch, and they bite on the spot. Shonda Rhimes did not have a script for, I don't want to lie, Scandal. How do, we, how do I get away with murder? One of those two. She didn't have a script for it. She just pitched. So no, you don't have to have the pilot. But as a new writer, nine times out of ten, you do. Because why would someone bring you into a room to talk to them without having proof that you kind of know what you're doing already? Thanks for watching. Need help with your screenplay? Go to awriterforyourwriter.com. That's awriterforyourwriter.com.